right, so I don't have any quote for the beginning of my presentation, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm going to do a brief introduction about myself and what I do. Uh, my company, at my company, we, we usually try to do a lot of research and development around uh, what we call responsive architecture to enable organizations to actually cope with the rapid changes in the market. We try to do that uh, uh, through uh, many technologies, but at the moment we focus mainly on enterprise architecture and uh, information and integration. Uh, as, uh, uh, as I've said before, uh, I have uh, about uh, over 20 years of uh, professional experience in IT, and I try to maintain the balance between uh, technology and uh, business by my academic background. Uh, it's quite the picture, quite old, but uh, yeah, that's to me. Uh, okay, so that's probably my main statement for this presentation, okay? So, one of the main objectives here is actually to uh, understand the importance of uh, maintaining the traceability all across from your strategy definition down to your service implementation. So, I will start with um, a quite um, academic um, model, but it's quite simple and it usually helps me to understand uh, most of these buzzwords of the moments around capabilities and, and business process and DevOps and etc. and how you actually support the business with all these uh, uh, new terms. So I'll probably start with the, the top right where you usually do a kind of a brief analysis of uh, your uh, external environment to look at your market and see what your customers want and uh, understand how your company actually does business. And then uh, you usually look internally to understand what uh, resources and capabilities you have within your organization to support your strategy to hopefully get some competitive advantage. So my main focus will be around this area here and specifically around IT resources and capabilities. So uh, most of the organizations, they actually have um, some uh, quality management cycle and continuous improvement ideas to see how they are actually doing and how they are planning for the future and how they are implementing. So this is a quite generic one. Most of the main frameworks, enterprise frameworks, use something like that. But I try to keep that very simple. So normally you start analyzing what you have and then uh, you uh, build your plan for the short, medium and long term. And then it comes to the hard part, which is the implementation. How are you going to implement your strategy? And after a while, what one of the main gaps that we have at the moment, how are you going to monitor that? How are you going to actually tell your stakeholders that you actually are uh, realizing the benefits that you're promising? So at the top, we usually have the business strategy. And then uh, uh, from our perspective, we have our technical implementation. I put some very generic steps here uh, on how we usually break down. Different companies have different approaches, but uh, usually they come more or less on these uh, different levels here. So you have your, uh, as part of your analysis, you usually have a kind of capability gap analysis to understand where your company is doing well, where it's not doing well. So you have a, a list of your business capabilities that need to enhance, you need to change, and then you usually break down into business process and functions. And then the main area that, area that I'm talking about today with the application and services from the IT perspective is what we're actually going to provide to the business in order for them to run uh, and cope with all the challenges that they have. And underlying this one, we have actually the technical implementation. So I have your technical infrastructure. I'm not covering that today, but uh, uh, so just to uh, understand where, we're, well, where we are uh, focus in this uh, presentation, we are talking about application and integration or exposing of the services. So ideally, from the enterprise architecture perspective, you try to map all these areas within your enterprise repository. Right? So, so then you have a, a kind of a holistic view of your business and how all your IT assets, IT resources and capabilities are actually linking to your business, supporting your business. So, let's talk about uh, um, how usually we solve the problems of an organization, right? So, usually you have a project that's trying to solve, have a mandate, and then the, it's trying to uh, fill a gap that you have in your, in your uh, technical infrastructure, and have a solution architecture area, uh, basically defining some options and analyzing which one is the best one, doing some planning, and then uh, uh, gathering the requirements that you need for a specific solution, and then doing the solution itself. 
And this area here is basically the intersection between uh, the solution architecture and uh, the integration or application service governance. Right? So at this, at this part here, after the solution architect identified some uh, candidate services, it will usually talk to an uh, integration architect or uh, someone that's responsible for the governance of services and say, look, I need to provide these business functionalities to my consumers, so uh, I think that these are the services that I need. These are my candidate services. So during this phase here, they usually uh, do some analysis, some profiling of the services, see if they don't have any duplication of services within your repository, and see if they make sense, they are feasible and suitable for your solution, etc. After you check all those boxes, and then you go for the modeling phase, where you're actually going to say, okay, I have the service now, so uh, uh, what are the operations that I need for the service? What are going to be the, what's going to be the service signature? So what are the inputs and outputs that I have for the service and etc. policies and whatever you need. So uh, this is the area that I'm working on, right? So this is where I actually uh, propose the integration between uh, enterprise architecture repository or modeling tool to uh, the governance. Because the, all, the, all the, uh, the rest of the life cycle is actually out of the box, as you could see in the previous presentation. They have all the capabilities that you need uh, for uh, going on and tracing the, the development, test, deployment, monitoring and retirement of the service. All right, so based on, on, uh, on our experience with a few clients, this is the main gap that I found between uh, um, an EA repository tool and, uh, and service governance, right? So usually, suppose that you have actually a very mature uh, enterprise architecture approach. So from the integration perspective, you would have a few assets that you are actually interested to capture as part of your integration architecture. So you may have your, the definition of your logical application that's probably linked to the physical application from the enterprise perspective, but at this point in time, I'm not really interested in the physical application. I'm more interested in understanding uh, what it is. And then uh, the definition of the application interface, so what's the functionality that I'm exposing from that uh, specific application to align with the business functionality, right? And then based on that one, you can still, you sometimes model the abstract version of the contract. So you have an abstract version of the Weasel or the Swagger uh, that you want actually to uh, expose to the integration guys for, the, for their implementation, right? Another side, you have uh, uh, the list, as presented before, you have uh, the list of the services and the contracts and the management of the life cycle as it goes on. Main problem is that uh, usually this transition is done by some uh, different artifacts, right? So you usually have the architects producing uh, Word documents, spreadsheets with some uh, high-level mappings or requirement mappings, and etc. Some diagrams and presentation, mainly for the communication and alignment with the other stakeholders, right? So you need some kind of approval and you need some feedback as well to understand if you're actually implementing your solution correctly. The problem is that you actually do this documentation manually, right? So, uh, and then after some time, after you go through all the, the, the review cycle, you usually have some feedback. Then you have a feedback from the presentations and need to change something on spreadsheets, and need to change something on documentation, and then documentation needs to present that again to have another validation, and then you go on and on, and then you have what I call the woolly gap, which is really, really hard to maintain. You know, it's very difficult and complex, actually, to understand uh, the release of your documents and how uh, the approval process as well. And the main interface between the enterprise repository and all these artifacts is the famous Ctrl-C, Ctrl-V, right? So, not great, not traceable as well. And on the other side, you have, you have handcraft artifacts. So you have uh, someone actually typing the XSDs and the WSDOs, and then it's not great as well, and you don't have any traceability. So based on this gap, these are the main issues that we've been finding, okay? So you have lack of traceability, you don't know actually what you have on your store governance uh, side, how it traces back to your enterprise architecture. So when someone does an, inter uh, uh, an impact assessment, for example, for a specific solution, 
They have no idea of what is on the other side, what is live, what is running, what's going well, what is not. Other projects that may be using the same solution. Uh, again, some have some inconsistency on the in documentation, so all that's a review cycle that you have and manually changing documents and manually uh, uh, managing other releases and approval process is really, really complex. And of course, it increases cost and time. The consequence of that, it creates resistance of change. So every time you say, wow, uh, it sounds great, but if you actually make this change at this part of your solution, it would be more future-proof, it would be more in line with the business, and people say, oh, no, no, I have to go back and actually you know, change all the documents and do, do all that, change presentations, spreadsheets, and et cetera. They say, no, no, I don't want, really want to change. So that's the culture that you usually uh, have as a consequence of this approach. And then, if you do man anything manually, you're prone to human error, you know? Uh, so, what's the proposed solution? Again, we have uh, our mature model on both sides. Then, what do we usually do? Okay, so we do integration with clouds, we do integration between complex systems, we implement complex uh, event process systems. So, why not do an, automate, an automatic synchronization between these two? So, let's start to look. People are talking a lot of about DevOps, you know, how you actually develop and, and put that in production quite quickly. But what about your architecture? What about the other side? When you actually have the traceability back to your business, when you need to prove that you're actually realizing the business benefits, how do you do that? You know, it's difficult. So if you, if you come to an approach like that and you start to look at your tools, our architecture tools and governance tools, and bring them together and integrate the technologies there, as you could see before, all the capabilities are there, you know? You just need to implement it. It's much, much easier than any cloud integration, any system-to-system -system integration, right? So, and that kind of approach brings other benefits as well. So, when you actually look at the other potential integrations as well, so say, oh, we still need documentations, we still need to actually tell other stakeholders about what we are doing, right? So, come on. It's quite easy. You just need for most of the enterprise repository tools, they can do automatic generation of documentation, right? So you can just create templates, and based on your solution, on everything that you write on your EA2, you can publish that. On the other side, the same thing, okay? So you have integration with most of the analytics tools, so you can actually, based on all the KPIs that you're defining on your service, and this is really important. I think Isabel was talking about that yesterday, around how you actually show your business benefits. You know, uh, to the other stakeholders. This is where you capture all the information and you feed an analytics tools for, to generate reports and prove to your company that you're actually having a return on your investment and making profit or saving money through that automation. And of course, another consequence is of all this, of this approach is you have a better enterprise-wide visibility, you have better discoverability, you have a better impact assessment. So all the way to the top of the organization, you, have, you start to have like senior managers looking at that and say, yeah, okay, this is actually the right direction, this is the right technology that we're going to use, this is actually what, how we're going to uh, leverage our business. So uh, the potential here for uh, all these uh, points is up to your imagination, you know. Again, in the, from the document generation as well, most of the, some of the things we are starting to do now is around this area here. So usually Word documents, they're very difficult actually to maintain, right? mainly around the releases and etc. So you could use some wiki. Most of the companies that have technologies that uh, uh, um, uh, work like a wiki, like for example, Confluence. We have some clients that actually are trying some things around Confluence and how you actually have your solution documents. Or that specific part of the solution documents that actually are uh, relevant to a specific group of stakeholders. For example, a business analyst doesn't want to read like 100 pages of a solution architecture. He may be interested only on the, on the business architecture part of that. So you can even build those segments and send that specific part to the specific stakeholders to get an approval or a feedback. Okay, then why have we chosen uh, uh, the governance registry from WSO2? Uh, first one, interoperability. I think that uh, uh, I, I will talk about uh, in the next about it in the next slide. But we use uh, the admin services from the uh, um, from the governance registry actually to uh, enable the interoperability with the EA2. 
So out of the box, it's, it provides you a set of web services that can uh, probably give you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it provides the entire uh, uh, functionality that you have on the management console. You can have that through these web services, right? So this is how we enable the automation between these two. User experience, again, on the previous presentation, you could see that uh, it's, it's really great. Comparing to the other tools in the market, I think that it has the right separation of concerns from coming from the, from the publisher side to the store concept, you know, and uh, it's beautiful, simple, because uh, most of the governance tools, sometimes they're very clunky, and the, the user are quite resistant to use that because they have too many things, and then I think uh, WSO2 start with the right approach of a given the simple, basic, important uh, functionality that you need from the governance perspective, easy to use, and really easy to extend. So the customization, most of the things, most of the, the customization that is done in this, in this case, for this specific PLC that we've done, uh, was based on the configuration of XML files. So really, really easy. And again, open source is another discussion that we've been having uh, in this event. But the main point for us was uh, cost and extensibility. So this is just an overview of the technical implementation, what we've done uh, uh, on, the, on the EA repository side. Uh, they have a framework for the specific technology that we use. They had a framework that used uh, 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 an add-in concept, an add-in framework, uh, and you need to develop that, develop that in C-sharp. The good thing is that we didn't know where to start, and then uh, uh, on, the, on the governance register side, they have a, a, a set of sample codes that you can use as a starting point for you to understand how to connect and what to do. So it was, it was uh, a very uh, uh, rapid learning for us by, get, by getting these examples and sample codes. On the other side, of course, we use the admin services out of the box, ready to use there. And then uh, this is, these are actually the information that we are currently uh, implementing. At the moment, uh, we have only one way to the right on the service definition about Wizards and Swagger. We are implementing now the service life cycle as well, so you can actually uh, change the life cycle uh, on your uh, uh, EA repository and synchronize that back to your uh, registry. And at the same time, you can apply some rules. For example, if you remember the life cycle that I put here before, and have identification and uh, and, uh, and the modeling phase, for example, I can actually say, okay, if it's on identification phase, only solution attacks, for example, can uh, publish candidate services for identification purpose. And then after that, after approved, only the integration attacks or service designers can actually uh, um, model the service and publish uh, the contracts, swaggers or whistles. Right? And then it links back to the service that was defined, all the traceability that you have uh, in the two, in the GRAG2 actually show the dependence between the definition of the service, the respective policies, and the respective contracts. Um, I'll, I plan to do a demo, but um, I don't have time. So uh, I would like to propose if anybody wants to see it, how it works in practice, and uh, you can spare like 10, 15 minutes during lunchtime. I'm more than happy to show that on my laptop. And then that's it. If you want to contact me, please keep in touch. Feedbacks are always welcome. I'm always, always learning from this, this conference when I have some good feedback. And I take that on board to understand what I'm going to do in the future. So thank you very much for your attention.